Hello and welcome to the ninth edition of the Touchline Fracker podcast. I'm your host Lewis and on this week's show we will be discussing what makes and defines a person as ready to take over a managerial role amidst calls for Ryan Giggs to be appointed the new permanent manager of Manchester United. Our guests this week are regulars United supporting Mariah and Arsenal supporting Mickey as well as two debutants Arsenal supporter Anton who you may well know as Ant Sulk on Twitter and United supporter Gaz, who goes by Midnight Gaz on Twitter. So let's just jump, jump straight into the main topic. Uh, earlier on in the week, Anton, yourself and Mickey were debating via Twitter over whether Giggs is ready to take over the reins at United on a more permanent role. Uh, just explain yeah. your stance. Well, my, my point was that the, the objection to Giggs being given a job was him lacking experience at I have a big problem with that on the basis that, that Ryan Giggs has been playing professional football since 1991. Yeah, He's been playing for Manchester United since 1991. He's gone from a left winger to a central midfielder, coach. He's won everything, seen everything, been under the best manager the world has ever seen. Yeah, so For people to say he lacks the experience, I, I just find it laughable. Like, I, don't, I don't see how anyone can have any more experience than he has. Like, so to say he should go to the championship or something to, or I read take a year out and study the game more. Like study what? What is there for Ryan Giggs to pick up? I, I did. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Okay. Well, Mickey, you were on the other side of the fence. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, what Anton just said? Well, my thoughts were, you know, no one is dismissing the value of being a top class player with longevity and working on the best coaches. But there have been other co- other players uh, working under better coaches with better teams for just as long, and they haven't had a candle. Like, they can hold a candle to some of the other top-tier managers because, ultimately, there is a difference between having a top playing ability, a top coaching ability, and, yes, whilst Ryan Giggs has been doing some coaching on the side, obviously more so this season prior to the season uh, before, and um, he was taking his badges... I think he started taking his UEFA B a little while ago, and I think he's currently or has completed his UEFA A. Um, that if you look at all the other um, top managers that become top players that become top managers, is they've have had that experience away from the club. They've had, they've had to essentially go into the trenches, which isn't something that Ryan has done yet. So, look at the end of the day, a, a, a coach with top coaching quality and top playing experience will always have the, the advantage over someone who just has top coaching ability but there's no evidence to suggest right now that Ryan Giggs as a coach is of the necessary quality to lead Manchester United which is the biggest team in the world arguably OK um, Moreau where do you sit on this? I mean how far does um, experience as a, as a player go towards you know, having experiences and, and becoming a good manager? You know, for me, there's two sides to it. There's the tactical side and the man management side. And what I've realised is you can't really be a top, top coach without having a good grasp of both. And obviously, like Ant said, he's been at the top under Fergie and he's been at the club for 20 years. So man management-wise, I think he's got the whole dressing room. <clears throat> of course, the players are going to be respectful of him and his philosophy, whatever that may be. But then there's a side where I can see where Mickey's coming from, which is the tactical side, which is it's quite ambiguous. We really don't know what he's about, do we? So um, it would be a risk, personally. And I feel like for the next appointment, we have to get it right. We have to get 100% right. So at this stage, I wouldn't want to risk it with Ryan Giggs, personally. I think he's been a top player, but managing is just, it's just something else, man. Can't compare it for me, personally. OK. Um, Gaz? Hello? Giggs had uh, like one of the best mentors of all time in um, Sir Alex Ferguson. Yeah. Did Ryan Giggs ever strike you as um, a possible managerial candidate or even have managerial qualities, may- maybe say a few years ago? Um, if I'm honest, out of all the bunch, the class of 92, as we all know what they're called, um, it was Gary Neville that struck me as that, you know, the leader, the one that would probably become the United manager. Um However, as years have gone on, I think um, 
from my point of view as a United fan, I've gone to see. He's obviously a leader in the room. I think in terms of when Gary Neville wasn't fit or Vidic wasn't fit, Giggs was the one that got the captain's armband. He's obviously been at the club for however, however many years now. So um, I wouldn't say he did that um, a few years ago, but as years have gone on, he's become more of a leading figure. And obviously, um, I read an article recently um, in terms of it, someone was talking about whether he'd be able to coach in or something like that. I read an article where the players were praising Giggs recently for his coaching sessions, as in compared to what David Moyes was delivering when he was the gaffer. So, I don't know. I don't know. I would say, I don't want to cut in, but, um, Go on. you know, if you're going to use the fact that he's been at Manchester United for X amount of years, he's working as a top coach, yeah. he's won all of these things. So has Roy Keane. 100%. Oh, yeah. So, Roy, Roy Keane wasn't at Manchester United for that level of time, no? You, you wouldn't have that level of time, but he still was at the club during their peak, and he was. And to be honest with you, he showed more yeah. of the person, like the human qualities, to lead a team. He was more of a leader than Giggs. Okay, ever but would you not say the the adaption of Ryan Giggs' game is not testament to his tactical knowledge, knowledge, and and his football brain? Remember, uh, up until what, say six, seven years ago, Ryan Giggs was just he was just a. a Great player, don't get me wrong. A pacey left winger. We know you never thought you'd see Ryan Giggs dictating football matches from the centre of the park. No, no, no. I agree with totally. you. And, and, and he has he has the intelligence and, and the knowledge of the game to to adapt his game in a way that not many players have. From no, my no, record, no, no, the only wingers I, I, I remember you. doing that are him and the other one doesn't really serve my point, but was John Barnes. But um, yeah, there, there's not many that can do that. No, no, no. I agree with you completely. But again, it, it goes to the point where. You know, it's about tailoring your individual game and understanding how the game of 11 men work in opposition to another 11 men. I'm not saying that that has no value. It does. But for me, it's just not enough. If someone right had now. turned around and said to me, I have one more and have proven as a manager, I'd have said, yeah, fair enough. But what, what I objected to, and I will always object to, is the experience being, being a factor and taking time out to, to, to understand the game more. Those are the points that I objected to. I also looked up. Jurgen Klopp went from being a player at what's how do you pronounce it? Mainz, Mainz, yeah, straight, straight to manager. Yeah, retired and became player. Same. So, so there's proof. There's proof it does work. I don't it can think. Work, but sorry, I don't want. I don't, don't want to keep cutting out. Yeah, I, I, I don't think. I think either way, there's a risk in terms of who you hire, no matter who you hire. So if you hire yeah, Ryan Giggs, yeah, there's the risk that um, he has no experience. But then there's the fact that he knows the club, he knows the league, he knows the players, he's got the players' respect. There's a risk if you hire Van Gaal, he doesn't know the Premiership. So there's a risk, no matter there's what all, you do. There's always going to be a risk. I thought there was going to be a risk, but the thing with... If, you, if you're going to use Jurgen Klopp or, let's say, Clarence Seedorf or people in Zaghi Mancini in Italy, the difference is, and I feel pretty confident in saying this, is that they come from very different coaching cultures as opposed to what happens over here. Now, yeah, okay. yes, that's true. Yes, Ferguson is arguably one of the great. I don't think he is the best. I think it's too it's too many managers to say that. But he is arguably one of the greatest club managers of all time. But at the same time, no one can actually say he's one of the best coaches of all time. Like, no, he, he, delegated that. he wasn't a coach. He's a manager, though. Yeah, he it's delegated that to essentially, to and, that's, and that's the point. That makes him the best. No, no, no. But that's, that's the point. Like, if we're going to talk about, bear in mind, I've not um, dismissed any of Ryan Giggs's man management abilities. I actually think that that's probably going to be strength right now. I think the majority of the players, the reason they're kind of rating his coaching so far is because of his man management, not so much the actual sessions. However, my thing is, is that he has to kind of experience a little bit more in terms of the coaching aspect. Managers from Italy, Spain, Germany, France, Italy, I don't know if I repeat myself just now, but they come from different coaching cultures. And in Manchester United, yes, he was under, manage, um, under Ferguson, but Ferguson delegated a lot. And when you say he, different co- coaching cultures, are you are you, are you p- purely basing that on, on how far behind the English game is? I'm not going to say how far behind. It's just for me. It's just the approach. I mean, you've, I made the point to you when we we're talking about last Saturday in Italy. Doesn't matter what level of the game that you play, that you have to go to university. There's a process in Germany. You know, you have players taking their badges not during the twilight of their careers. At the peak of their careers, they're taking their, their badges. Um, in Holland, for example, I mean, Holland, you know, is probably yeah. standard better, but you have children that talk tactics at levels that adults in this country don't talk to them about. So, 
for me, it's just not the it's not just the implementation of the coaching culture, but it's just even the average fan. And yes, he will have learned a lot from Ferguson, but in terms of his actual coaching, oh, did he learn a lot from Mike Phelan, from Carlos Quiros, from Rene Milistein? Are these the guys that he's watching, or is he just watching Ferguson? These are the guys. These are the guys he's been working with. So no, I know, no, I know, but I know, but at the same time, it's we need to see evidence of that being transferred to the pitch. Now you can say, okay, it's only been one game, but we usually have an idea of how a coach runs his team or sets up his team. Even from an interview, from a press conference, we start to see the way he speaks about football. And I personally, unless I've missed something, I've not seen anything like that from, from Ryan Giggs, not just before the Norwich game, but even when he first started taking his badges, which was two to three years ago. So right now... As in a playing I'm style, Jimmy, in a playing style of the way he sees the way it should be played. Is that what you yeah, mean? It's, it's, it's just the way he's... he's is, it, is it the way a player plays a kind of like proof of their playing philosophy, though? Like you'd never, because if Lee Catamol became a manager tomorrow, none of us would expect him to play like Barcelona style football, would we? No, no, like, no. no I, I agree. It could, it could definitely be an indicator. But I've also seen coaches that were. They said George Graham, when he was playing, he was actually more of a, you know, not a player player. Player, player player, but he was like a technical player. And then, you know, fast forward 20, 30 years, however long it took for him to start coaching, and 1 0 to the Arsenal all the way. So. It, it depends. Like I said, it could definitely be an indicator. That, 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 was a, that was a media thing, though. That's, that's, that's not actually a true reflection of the way Arsenal played at the time. That's, right, that's right. a media thing. Well, I, I didn't watch it. I'm not going to sit like... I, I'm, I'm old enough, enough to remember, innit? Yeah, so, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to dispute on that too much because I'm, 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 I'm watching them to that degree at five years old. But that's, it can definitely be an indicator. But right now, I think it'll be wiser for them to go over coach like Van Howe and... Van Hal says it himself. He will always hire backroom staff from the current setup. Didn't Van Hal run Barca into the ground at one point? It wasn't Van Hal's fault. It was at the time. It was it's politics, just like it is right now. Like the lame, the layman will look at Barcelona right now and think it's all t- Tata Martino's fault. He doesn't know what he's doing. When it's more to do with Sandra Rosell, it's more to do with the fact that the directors are moving away from the Barca ethos, and it was exactly the same, if not worse, during the nineties under Van Hal. Um, Van Hal's a volatile figure. But one thing that you can't dispute about how that he leaves great foundations for whoever needs to take yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did that with Barca in the Barcelona, night, yeah. with Ajax, with um, Bayern Munich. He always kind of leads to great foundations. Short term, it may not be great in terms of the success that you you want, but I guarantee you that the next one two coaches that take over after him, and if we're talking about gigs, that's why I think it should be. I think it should take two to three years. Be Van Hal's understudy, which Van Hal I think would be more than happy to have him be. You'll so what happens if they if they make Giggs the understudy and then someone says, Oh, Ryan Giggs is available to manage they offer Ryan Giggs a job and he goes and he's doing well and Van Hal keeps, you know, I, Van Hal. I don't that, think that, he would that do that. Happen. I'll, I'll be very Go on, sir. So I'll be very personally speaking, I'd be very surprised if he did that. Even I think if Giggs was to go, if he was to get the wrong offer to him again at another point, come back, so, he'd, he'd, get, he'd take it straight away. He'd be yeah, on it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. Anton, um, I've got a question for you. I mean, we know <clears throat> that, you know, Wenger, despite what you may think of him or whoever else may think of him, his time at Arsenal is probably going to be coming to an end, if not this season, maybe in two years' time. Um, would your opinion change on Giggs if he was touted as the next Arsenal manager? Because of his know-how of Manchester United Football Club, would you say he is ready for the Arsenal job? You got me there. I probably, I probably wouldn't. I'll be honest. I probably wouldn't. And, and, and it's, it's on the basis that we've. Um, I want something different for my club in it. Like so, I, I wouldn't want him. I don't. I don't want someone. I, I want a proven winner. Like as a manager, we 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 can't afford any more experiments. Manchester United can afford experiments and projects. Can, we can't. Can. We, I don't think Manchester United project. can. I don't think they can. That's the thing. To and a degree, they, I don't they, think they, they can. They've had one year based on players not respecting a bad appointment. It's. I, I can't see United being in this situation next year. Whoever they put in charge, really interesting. So, is it? Would it be fair to say that your definition of a, a manager being ready, probably? Isn't just reliant on the manager itself, but maybe reliant no, on the well, club what as well. I'm saying is, I think Giggs is ready to be a manager. Whether I'd want him to be Arsenal manager is is, is a but different kettle of fish. Would, David would, Moyes is ready to be a manager. I wouldn't want him to be Arsenal manager. Would he? Be, but would he be ready to take over that? To, to take over from Arsene Wenger? That's. 
How how could I just don't understand how he could not be? He's the same age as a lot of managers. Like there's managers what Villas Boas and that were younger than than Giggs is. Do you know what I mean? Like Rogers was probably younger than Giggs is when he first got his manager's job. Mm. Martinez, Sosa. Like there's a lot of people that were younger than what he is now, not, and they didn't have half the experiences he had. Sorry, and, and it's not the age because yes, um, Rogers and Villas Boas um, didn't have the um, playing experience, being in the actual environment. Rogers is a learner of the game. He studies the game. It's, at the end of the day, he's been a student in the game since he was 15 years old. If we're talking about Vesh Boas, you know, Rogers has been ever since he got injured because he was I an know, expert. but then we're saying student of the game, right? Gigs, do, do people, do people think no, footballers no, don't, don't? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Like, it's no, not to say. Listen, it's not to say that they don't watch the game. Like literally, they finish the game, they go home, eat dinner, and then sleep 10 hours, and then rest, and then go training. It's not to say that, but I think. The, the thing is, the cult, the culture in England is they, they forget how studious the modern coach has to be. And there is no way, even for this whole time that gives him been playing football, that he would have been studied football to the same extent as, not even, let's not even say Rodgers or Virch Bowers, even the normal first team coach. At Why? Because it's, it's not documented to us. Uh, did you listen to Stan Collymore's driving on um, Saturday evening? I didn't. Oh, I didn't. Partly, yeah. Okay, Stan, Stan Collins, did you hear the part when he was talking about Sean Dyke? Yeah. No, I missed that. Burnley manager. I missed that. I missed that. And he yeah. said Sean, Sean Dyke, when he was playing, would after his game, he would watch every game in the league and he would pay attention and he was studying the game. And he had a teammate that was Sean Dyke's best friend. And Sean Dyke would do things like that. Now, we wouldn't know that because that's not documented. Like, there's a lot of good coaches and a lot of good work in this country that... <laughs> Because it's not doesn't have the continental ring to it and the flair and, and and I hate this when people like Allardyce come out with comments like if my name was Allardyce I'd get more respect and silly lists like that. But there is a small element of truth in it. There, there's a very small element of truth in it. For example, when Rogers and Martinez was meant to be up for the Liverpool job at first, no no one people were laughing at the idea of Rogers. No one was laughing at the idea of Martinez. I, I agree with you, but this is the, this is the point. That's Sean Dyke. We don't. I, I just. I just about know who he is. If Ryan Giggs was that kind of student of the game, best believe we would know about it. And right. Look point. at look at take Joey Barton for example. Look at who who knew Joey Barton was who he was until Twitter came around. None of us would have had a clue. We just thought he was any fuck. That's. I agree. With you. Of, but listen, this is Ryan Giggs. This is this guy is a modern day legend in England. Okay. And. Whatever platform, yeah. Listen, I, listen. I have a subscription to Four Four Two Magazine, World Soccer. I'm on all kinds of articles and blogs. No, no, no. Like I'm being honest, right? Ryan Giggs always yeah. features in these kind of publications. And yes, we do know about the you know him taking a thousand yoga classes so he can prevent injuries, and him taking his UEFA B and going on to his UEFA A licenses and whatnot, right? But I, I I'm only going to speak for myself. I'm not going to say we, but I don't get the impression that he's the student of the game to the point where his playing experience, which is very valuable, no one's discounting that, coupled with his actual studying of the game, those two elements are at the same level where you can go straight into um, a manager position at Manchester United. And I'm not saying he's not good enough to be a manager anywhere else, but at Manchester United, listen, we've got a do lot. It's a similar kind of playing career in the sense that he's been at the top level at top club for a long time. The difference was that at the age of 20, you had his teammates and his coach saying, this guy's a coach. When he left Barcelona, he went to Brescia. And he went specific. He went there. He didn't go... To, he could have gone to Juventus. He could have gone to Manchester United because both of them were after him at the time, right? He went to Brescia because he wanted to learn certain elements of the game. They went to Brescia. And then afterwards, he didn't go to England or to France or to Germany. He went to the Middle East. Mm. The Middle East, right? There is no... It wasn't for money. He was there to learn different things. Then afterwards he goes to Mexico, goes to Argentina. What did he learn about football in the Middle East? You'll find a lot of these developing countries um, are either at the same level or way ahead in terms of sports psychology and sports science and sports oh, analytics. Okay. They have a lot. To, we have a lot to learn. I'll tell you that for free because they, have, they because they have to compensate for the lack of football in background in these countries. Then they have to make it up in other ways. So in America, you'll find that the culture is actually better than it is in Europe in a lot of ways. So he goes to the Middle East, he goes to Argentina, he goes to Mexico. Now, I'm not saying every up-and-coming manager has to do the same thing, but essentially you have to come out of your comfort zone to do... Like, he was... Those were his trenches. He had to go to the trenches to learn something different. So when he comes back 
and manages the Barcelona B team, he's way ahead of his curve. I'm not saying that's the norm because, like you said earlier, uh, Klopp, he went from player almost straight into management and he did very well with the Mainz team. Dag- However, Daglish as well. Daglish as well, but again, Daglish, even as a player, he was he was something else. He wasn't just like gigs where he was a wide man and he went to centre mid. He was, you know, he was tactically intelligent, but he had this thing off the pitch where he was a football man. Like he, he lived and breathed football. He was a student in the game. He was a coach. You saw it as a player in his peak. He was a coach. So, not to say that Giff can't go on to become that, but the evidence so far to me suggests that he hasn't had that football education in terms of coaching ability in terms of learning the tactical aspect the mental aspect like you know so Mickey you I know mean what? Go on, go on, sorry, right, go on. I mean, um, what I think is a good thing for Ryan Giggs is the fact that he's, he would be managing in England I think aside from the big games tactics aren't as stressed here as they perhaps are in Europe or in the Champions League so I feel like if he is maybe learning on the job. I wouldn't do it personally, but if he's learning on the job, I think he'll have the man management down pat because he's been with these guys their whole career, so he knows what they're like. So in that sense, like even managers like, um, what's the guy at Crystal Palace? Tony Pulis. I look at the job he's doing and I wouldn't say he's anyone who's particularly like a tactical whiz or anything. He's a good man manager. He drills his teams well. They're prepared to play who they're facing every week. Oh, so I think that, 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 that's oh, good tactics, surely. Yeah, that's a good tactic, surely. I think, no, I, think that's more, I think that's more the man management, to be honest with you. Oh, They're a hard-working that, you know. team. Nowadays, they, all the players love Ian Holloway as a man manager. He'll make you feel like a million dollars, but he can't set you out to not get your ass kicked. I'll be, I'll be very honest with you. I think your tactic is probably more advanced than he gets credit for. <laughs> it's because it's, it's, because it's an ugly so tactic. Well, to be fair. It's because, because it's ugly tactic. I don't think the style that Crystal Palace play are similar to what we saw at Stoke in his early days. I think there's a, a big contrast between the level of the game. Which is good. I mean, my thing is, uh, let's take, take take away from Ryan Giggs as well because I want to kind of move on to just the general principle of how do you judge who's ready. And I think, well, you know, it's an evolving game. So you can't keep on using the old standards of 10 to 15 to 20 years ago. Um, the current elite managers have such a mi- mixture of ability and the stakes are higher. So who, are the, who are the current elite? Who are the current elite? In my, in my opinion, 5-6, Pep, Mourinho... Ancelotti, Simeone, um, Klopp. Did I say Klopp? Did I say Klopp? No. No. Yeah. Fine. So what's that? Pep, Ancelotti, Mourinho, Klopp, Simo- Simeone. Simeone. So that's yeah. what, That's your top five? Currently, currently, right now, over the last three seasons, I would say comfortably top five, yeah. Interesting. Hitting doesn't get in there at all? No. Why does Simeone get... I'm not that I dispute the, the thought of Simeone, but why does he get in there ahead of someone, maybe Brendan Rodgers, I don't know. Why does he get in there? Um, he's, won, uh, he's won a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. He's, he's, I think purely that, like, people talk about what Liverpool are achieving right now. It's very, it's, it's quality. But what Atletico are doing, you have to understand the place they came from. Like, they were literally... They were down and out. They were a selling club. The, the hegemony between Barcelona and Real Madrid is unreal. Like, literally unreal. Um, and it's just the fact that they're consistently winning. Ever since he's took over, they're just consistently winning trophies. You know? They did impress and, me yesterday as well because there wasn't just one type of style of play which I saw in them. They were able to counter attack when they needed to. They were able to retain possession when they needed to. They read, There was different aspects of the game which were necessary which they yeah, made us the only, yesterday yeah the only reason I'm not just saying Simeone just you know because of what they've done yesterday and what they've been doing throughout the season like mm. people forget he was the guy in charge when Africa put four past the European champions in Chelsea like light work like they've been doing this for two to three years they've been doing it for a while and for me Rodgers is more than capable of getting into that elite however um, I'm kind of going over. I, I, I look. It's the same thing. Same way I rate players. I look at consistency over a number of seasons. Okay. And Simeone, alongside Klopp, alongside Pep Mourinho, and Ancelotti to a lesser extent, um, have demonstrated that. So the thing about Simeone is the fact that I think I mentioned it yesterday. I want to see what he does in Europe outside Atletico because you know he played there as well. So he kind of yeah, has definitely. a yeah, definitely. Yes, he um, yeah, he has a kind of special bond with the club. With the players, you can relate. Like you know, like you know what's on the line. 
And I don't know if you can recreate that kind of passion, that intensity at another club. So yeah, the fact it's fully. Do you know what? It's it's the same. Um, it's the same thing I said about Mourinho. Uh, Mourinho, for me, for his team to succeed, he has to create an underdog mentality. Yeah, a, all the time. Siege yeah. mentality, innit? Yes, yeah, the siege yeah, mentality. All the time. It's the same thing with um, Simeone throughout the season, only up until maybe the last month or so. Um, he's always been. We're not favourites. We're not favourites. Yeah. We're not favourites. We're not favourites. Um, and yeah, you're right. You know the fact that he was captain after Kajuni's uh, playing career. He comes back. They were already underdogs in a sense. So that is suited kind of helps. Definitely. But can you go to a team where you you are the favourites? Like you you are the best team. Can you go on and create? And those that? Ex- those excuses don't wash, sort of thing. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, so to be fair, Chelsea fan and Jose Mourinho. <laughs> I'm gonna start on him. <laughs> To be fair to Simeone, though, I, I, I'm sure he won a few trophies in Argentina. I don't, I don't know um, who. Um, he, I think he won coach, something with River Plate. Yeah, um, he took over because he was playing in Argentina. Then he went from player to manager straight away. But I, I didn't think he did too well there. Then he went to Italy, and he took over a team in Italy. Then Catania, too well there. I think it was. Yeah, and then he came to Atletico. Right. So, okay. you know. Um, so he like did said, his schooling he's in been, he's been South in the America. Trenches. Like, mm. all, all these top... Like, for me, every top manager has been in the trenches. And the thing with him as well is, obviously, as you lot, as you guys said before, he's he's had a couple of fa- failures, but he's had a couple unsuccessful tents as a manager. He's learned that nothing thing will go your way. He's come to Atletico now, and he, his team's flourishing, so... Yeah. Mm. OK. Um, so, Mickey, I mean, at what point would you suggest Ryan Giggs is ready? I know we're going back to Ryan Giggs, but I mean... It, you just need to you need him to get tutored like directly and for me it's just Van Howe like Van Howe looks more than like he's going to get appointed like Van so, Howe is so influential that people don't realise like you don't need to be the most successful manager to be the most influential you know shout out to Marcelo Bielsa and Van Howe has schooled a lot of people like you know um, so wait around do two to three years develop your coaching ability and then there's, after that, for me, there's absolutely no reason why he can't go on to be a top, top, top manager. So, are we certain that Van Howe um, would take Ryan Giggs under his wing? Because I, I did see an article the other day that talks had broken down because he didn't want Ryan Giggs as... There's been, there's been contrasting articles, to be yeah. fair. Some have said that he's going to be definitely in the ranks. Some have said um, Van Gaal wants to bring Clive and Co. So it's, yeah, it's that's been, what I thought, yeah. From what he definitely from... keeps one person from the old regime... Yeah. At the club, so yeah, there minimum. Someone and to for see. me, yeah. yeah, and like at the backroom stuff, I don't see who that would be apart from Ryan Giggs. But would that put. Per- hmm. Gone. Sorry, if, if, if it was Paul Scholes' name being touted, would, would, would you have the same objection? <laughs> yeah, I'd love Scholes to be manager, but I don't think he has a character for it. I don't really? think he'd want yeah. it. I don't think he has a character. The man management, he wouldn't be able to do it. He looks weird sitting on the bench. He doesn't look... Actually, you know, like, Skulls is, is a bit more of a, like, he's a bit more in his head. He's far ahead. Yeah, like, because like, like, you know what? Who's he's read, just um, biased, man, because Skulls is a little pretty player, man. This, this, this is a threat. <laughs> nah, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. And Lewis, have either of you read Dennis Bergkamp's book? Yeah. Right, so you, you, you've read it, right? So you can see the level of which he thinks about football. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, he strikes me more of a, as a coach as opposed to a coach and a manager, like that combination. Yeah. And for me, that's the feeling I get from Paul Scholes. I think mm. one-on-one... More of a teacher. Because I'm Manchester United, I wouldn't want to be coached by anyone else but him. I would want to like, learn from him, 100%. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Well, but, Scholes. Uh, yeah. Of course. But we're talking about that combination, and that's that's my point about Ryan Giggs. It's just that does he have the best of both worlds. So why can't Ryan Giggs be a manager who has good coaches around him? Back to he Alex could. Did. He could, but... Like I said, top managers, especially a team like Manchester United, it's not like it was in the nineties or early two thousands anymore. You need because the thing is, even backroom staff are as qualified or not more qualified than managers. Their managers. Yeah. Like nowadays, they're masters level, degree level. They've done their pro license. They've coached in different countries. They've learned different languages. They got they they constant student in the games. Right? They're not just gonna coach or listen to someone who just hasn't done it all. The reason that a guy like Mourinho or Guardiola or Rogers or Martinez and Klopp and all of these guys command that respect is because they've been in the trenches. They have done... Essentially, they've been in the mailroom. Hmm. 
they've been in the mailroom. They, they've done the grind. They, they fetch coffees. They've done all of that, in frequently speaking. And that's what the current modern soccer coach or football coach, sorry, that's me talking, that foreign stuff, that's what they've had to do and that's what's required. And, you know, I... I there, there's exceptions to, to every rule, though. There's no, some, someone, no. some, someone breaks every mould. I, I agree with you completely. But so, yeah, go on, Mickey. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Go on. So, and you think specifically for this Man United job, Giggs is ready, yeah? Not that you think he's ready to go out there, but just because of the experience he has at the club, etc. It, it, yeah? It's that, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that, say that again, and Say it again, I'm You're cutting out. It's the, the way the fans are down, the club is down, the players are down, I just think you give it to Giggs, it just gives the whole place an instant lift. Like, yeah, and I, I don't think you can put a price on things like that. Like, take, take Brendan Rodgers, for example. Brendan Rodgers has made a lot of players that a year ago were classed as average players look like well beaters this year. Yeah, like, just, just, just the lift that a, a manager can give certain players. You don't know the levels it can push them onto. Yeah. Like, you, you, you don't look at the difference in Jacko under Pellegrini to Mancini, just things like that. I think Giggs could have. But how long can you get by on the buzz, though? Eventually, you're going to get found out, man. Like always, like with a fraud. If you if you ain't got it, you'll eventually get found out, man. The buzz can only yeah. last so long. And to be fair, you... does he not pick that up in that time? Like there's gonna be an element before. Wait, one second, and you're like cutting out a bit. Does he does he not gain the experience that people are saying he does? I, 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 that's a fair point but my thing is I look at other examples that seem to be working much better and it seems to give more security and it gives the person an opportunity to learn look at Zidane right now Real Madrid Real Madrid are in a, in a, in a massive rut they're in a massive rut and I'm not going to say not to the extent of Manchester United but going off what happened with Mourinho the previous season they got someone that was experienced that could accommodate the team and accommodate the players and obviously deliver on the chairman's wishes but I also gave someone with relatively little coaching experience the chance to develop and now there's talks of Zidane taking over another team and that's just after one season I'm surprised that I don't season. hear Zidane touted with more jobs I'm very surprised about that to the point I even forgot he was at Madrid but that's the thing but even Zidane like he's already had a couple of seasons of dedicated coaching time with the Castillo he's in, I would assume even in his um, work as an ambassador he would have experiences in different footballing environments and different cultures, and those things matter. So even for him, those are quote unquote his trenches that he's he's, he's worked on, and that's why he hasn't. Maybe that's the reason he hasn't gone into, straight into management himself. Mm. Okay, you know, so a, guys, let's do a little. Place, sorry. sorry, go on. No, 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 no. I'm going, go on, go on. All right, what I was going to say is, but let's do a little exercise. I mean, do you reckon you could pick out? players who are in today's game who not coming towards the end of their careers but who are probably maybe in their peak um and maybe do a little prediction game and sort of you know say who could who would be managerial material at this point in time i mean is there anybody that sticks out right now to Xavi anybody Hernandez. sorry Xavi Hernandez. yeah but, Xavi's a bait one though but i, I think Xavi's a bait one yeah but I, i'm talking about players who are out there peak because he's yeah. an intelligent Yeah. And he don't, we don't say the same names. Yeah, he'd only come up playing the philosophy that he's played under anyway, because that's what he believes in as a player anyway. Like, mm-hmm. if we try to it for, like, the Barca kind of guys, the Spaniards, the, the deep midfielders, there's certain players that just come into mind straight away, man. I think another player that, or another player that might be, um, or another bait one, actually, Philip Lahm. But I think yeah, it's probably... Yeah. I think, I think if, if you're German, you're just basically, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just uh, comes, Van comes into the territory. Yeah, I think Van Persie would be a good coach. No, no, no. <laughs> don't know if he'd be a good manager, but I think he'd be a good coach. Mm. A, a good coach, yeah. You're <laughs> saying technical players. Like, it's such a bias, yeah? Like, it's an assumption. And this is what I said. The assumption is based purely on the way players play football. Because you're still seeing kicks as that winger, that's why you're not... This is the pattern. This is the pattern. The players that we've named so far, these are players that 
but you're going to say, okay, it's documented, and other players don't get the same kind of coverage. But these are the players that whenever they're interviewed, they don't just talk about their position or, you know, what they do. They talk about the game in a holistic sense. Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, even players like, let me think of someone else. Let me think of someone else. Like, for me, yes, they may be all technical players, but again, think about where these players come from in terms of their background and the culture of that background. You know, there's not many in, there's not many English players that you can say the same thing of, and there's and there's a reason for that. Like for me, the, like I don't know if you you know about this, right? But the FA in this country, they've not even created a course um, for talent development. So that means essentially scouts and people that go out to go pick players and to see who's going to get to development centers and and academies and whatnot. Not to say that these are guys just off the street. Yes, they may have their coaching badges and whatnot, but... but effectively, they are. A lot of scouts pick up kids that scores the most goals in the game. I, I've seen it. I've seen my son have nightmares on the pitch, but score three. And I have two scouts come up to me. I've seen him have worldies, and where he didn't score, no no, no one said anything. Like, I, I've seen it with my own eyes and my own child. Right, it's exactly. And, and, that's what, and, that's what, it's and that's what I mean. It's just like, if you look at that, in terms of how it was before, because right now the FA are making changes. But if you're looking at that, if you look at how much youth coaches, and I'm talking from first-hand experience, how much they get paid, or sorry, how little they get paid, then that tells you how much they value, how they really value coaches in this country. So go to anywhere else. And listen, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Right? I, I was, um, I had to, I work for Fulham. So I also work at the foundation. What we do, we do commercial tours. We have, at a, an academy come over from Canada, right? So under 15s, under 16s, under 17s. And I've never had this before, right? Maybe I, I, I tend to coach bad youths, right? First thing they do, they get changed. They come in. Every single one of them came in, gave me a handshake. Hello, coach. Good morning, coach. Hello, coach. Ready to play, right? Whenever any coaches that I speak, I've spoken to, when they're coaching women, their approach to the game is so much different. The way that they actually want to learn, they want to develop their technique and whatnot. Because the, because their ability might not be there as, as high as, as the males, they, they want to learn. In England, to learn. in England, we're incredibly passionate about football. You know, not to take anything away from that, but the way we approach coaching culture is so different. And that's my point. Like, we don't even hear British-based players really talk about it to that level. Not even talk about how they play, just talking about it. So... Do, do we respect it if they do? We, we, we've got a real fascination with everything foreign here, like with regards to football. Like, we, we, we respect everything foreign so much more than we respect our own. Like, we're all still in love with the Dutch way of football. A Dutch team hasn't done anything in Europe for how long? Uh, uh, the Dutch national team has never won the World Cup, but we're in love with the But then again, but then again it depends. But at the same time, how successful has Dutch football been? No, but that's, see, that's the way that you measure success. We're, we're in a culture where we only judge success on winning tournaments, which is obviously is the first indicator. I don't get it's, not, it's not only, but it's got to play a part. It's got to play of a course, part. Of course, of course, of course. But at the same time, they have won tournaments. You know, they've got, I mean, it may only be one. They're two-time finalists. Euro, Euro, Euro 1998. No, 88, 88, sorry. 88, 88. 88. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So... But it's the same thing I just said in terms is, is of... That, is, is that good enough, is that good enough for, for, for the country that has the reputation that Holland has in World Cup? No, but I'm using, but I'm using, I'm going to go back to the principle I use in terms of the most influential coaches. Sometimes the best coaches isn't, aren't the ones that win the most. Go, going back to my point, um, all the, in terms of the tiki, the tiki tacker coaches, right? Their biggest philosophy, um, what's it? Their biggest influence is Marcelo Bielsa. What major trophies have Marcelo Bielsa won in Europe? None. But all the top coaches currently who subscribe to that particular possession-based philosophy will swear by him. And that's when my was, point. Yes, he was Argentina manager, yeah? Yeah, he was at one point, yeah. Uh, what, and he was chief manager was the a while ago. I think did he, he win was, the world? Uh, did he win that? Was he in charge when they won the World Cup in 86? Was that him? No. No. Who? No. no. So he when was, was he in charge of Argentina? Uh, I'm going to go with early 2000s, early to mid 2000s. He's an Ackerman. <laughs> He's an odd man manager. His squad's kind of... He's a weird guy. He's, a, he's, he's an odd insane insane. But the point was, his influence is... You can't doubt his influence. 
in terms of all the current managers that subscribe to his philosophy. And that's my point. Yes, the Dutch, or you could use France as an example, um, you know, even Germany, even though they haven't won something major since 1996, if I remember correctly, 1996, yeah. Um, but it's not just the tactical aspect, because to win a tournament, the, re- the main reason the Dutch haven't won anything in years is because, essentially, they're mentally weak. Nothing to do with the football in the belief. Or the tactical ability, it's just the fact that there's a lot of infighting. It's more to do with psychological and, you know, social aspects, more to do with the actual coaching itself. So, just because... I don't know, I, I, other than Van Persie, does Holland have a world-class player in the world right now? Arjun Robin is a world-class? Pardon? Oh, I don't know about Robin. Robin, yeah, Robin, Robin, Robin Van Persie, other than them two? I would say... Schneider? Yes. Not anymore? No, no more. Schneider's nowhere near that level anymore. I would, I want to say he's world class. Holland don't have yeah, many world class players, but to be fair with you, they have very, 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 very good players that, as a unit, if the last World Cup is to show anything, you know, um, could do something. Rafael, and they've had a lot of players that didn't fulfill their potential. They had world class potential, but they didn't fulfill it. Rafael van der Vaart was equally as good as Schneider. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. he was better. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, it was better. You know, even, Kevin even Stru- people like Ryan Babel. And... Class. Um, to be honest with their current crop, their, their current crop of players coming up now, the youngsters, they've got a lot of potential world class players in there. Uh, Marco Van Ginkel is another one. Um, but who knows? Who knows? Who knows? All right, well, guys, let's leave it there. Um, in terms of the main topic, does does anybody have like any listeners' questions we can quickly run through? I have one. Yeah. Uh, is Essentially, um, this is a good one. I want to kind of get your opinions on this one. It was from Aluminium Scripto. That's what I'm going to call him because I have no idea how to pronounce the first part of his name. He, he, he described it last week. He said it was like a Latin word for uh, knowledge or something, I think. Yeah, he, he went to private school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, he asked after Bayern's defeat to Real Madrid and after Atletico's defeat, no, Atletico defeating Chelsea, sorry, um, is Tiki Taka football dead? Nah, I wouldn't nah, say no way. not for me. Nah, it's too well, it's too it's too easy to say that based on based on one or two results. That's too easy to say it's dead. Football goes in. I've noticed it goes in cycles in terms of a couple. Tiki Taka wasn't really dominant until Barca really imprinted it on world football. It just goes through cycles, man. That's the way I see it. It will be back when it's. It just depends on the way it's implemented by the players and the manager. I think it needs an evolution. Yeah, because I was about to say that. Now, now with every system in football, you, you be, teams become aware of it and they figure a way how to handle it and how yeah, to be. Yeah, you get found out. Yeah, so it hasn't. It hasn't. It's like it's become. To, it's come to the level where right, we're going to do this, and other teams have realised right, this is what beats that, and the the tiki taka style hasn't re- found a way to to counteract the the problems it faces yet. But it, it will in time. I'm not saying it, I don't think it's dead by any way, stretch or form, but it, it needs it needs tweaking. The same, same with anything. I, I, I mean, to say it's dead is a bit is a bit knee jerk to say the least, because two tiki taka teams have made the uh, Champions League semi finals this year. So I mean, two out of the best four. My no. um, my feeling on this is the fact that with Barcelona's domination, when any team dominates, they become public enemy number one. When any team dominates, anyway, it doesn't matter what style of football they play. But I think because the fact that it breeded kind of quote unquote over sophisticated players and coaches, and there was a sense of kind of superiority, and I think the average fan didn't like that. The average sport didn't like that, and I think it's kind of a rebuttal to that. Um, and it's going to get to a point where, like you said, it's going to get tweaked. It's going to start dominating again. Everyone's going to fall back in love with it. Um, and that no system is, is you know, is flawless. Every system has its flaws. What I will say is this, though, because I don't want to always sit on the fence. And I think something that we've spoken about with the podcast is it seems a bit too friendly, is the fact that if you look at all the greatest teams, the most heralded teams of all time, they've all played a, a variant of tiki taka football. Hmm. I think if you look at the Dutch team of the 70s, obviously Ajax, if you look at this current Spanish team, if you look at um, the Liverpool team of the 80s to an extent, they didn't play Tiki Taka as such, but they played a possession based Nah, game. nah, 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 nah. Nah? Nah, nah, nah that's a false label. Look, to, the chances are the better teams are going to have more of the ball. So to say it's, based on, it's not based purely on possession. Like, the better teams are normally going to have more of the ball. 
that that Liverpool team, they And we, and we caught about ten percent of what you said. <laughs> it's more about now. It's yeah, better it's, better, it's better now. Better yeah. Now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm saying I don't think that Liverpool team was. I think I think the the beauty of football is that there's so many different styles 100%. that work. Yeah, and, and, and we like them at different er- in different eras and at different stages. No, I, I agree uh, with you. I agree with you. I just think that even if it's not tiki taka as such, because you know, possession based game doesn't equal tiki taka. There's some, there's very specific variables to tiki taka football outside of passing the ball around. But I just think that if we essentially we're talking about teams that are proactive and teams that are reactive, and the proactive teams are always the more more heralded ones, and that's for a reason. Would I you put any of the Brazil teams under that label? I'll put them I'll, like I would. I'll put them as a possession based team because they want the ball. That's, that's my thing. I don't like to say that possession-based teams are attacking teams because whether you're possession-based or non-possession-based, equally you could be attacking and equally defensive on each side of the spectrum. But what I will say is this, though, that I do think that it takes more talented players, individuals, and it makes the game look better when you have a team that is possession-based. You need You can't have a team of machines and make it a possession-based team. I think it takes more talented players to make Tiki Taka football work than it would for a reactive team. Okay. okay. Well, do you, uh, can I, I want to ask a quick question. Go on. Um, I don't know if you guys saw some comments that came out from Jose recently. It was a book and Jose is basically talking about um, possession. Oh, uh, yeah, and I did see it, yeah. And he's made a couple comments. I'll read a few of them out. Um, he said, the game is won by the team who commits the fewest errors. Football favours whoever pro- whoever provokes more areas in the opposition. Away from home, instead of trying to be superior to the opposition, it's better to encourage their mistakes. Um, whoever renounces possession reduces the possibility of making mistakes. So basically, he's trying to say it's better to have let the opposition have the ball. So they make more mistakes. What do you guys think of that? I, I completely I'll, agree I'll with them. that. I am not going to lie to you. That disgusts me. <laughs> yeah, me as well. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's, that's proper anti-football. I, I, yeah, I, I proper. can't get with that. But it, makes sense, it. No, it makes sense to me. I don't. It makes sense. I understand the logic. I just don't like the theory. No, it's, yeah, of it's course, it's, it's, it's a bit anti-football, of course, but I, 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 can, I, I can't call argue it, with the logic. Call it anti-football. My thing is, the reason that disgusts me is essentially is because that's very distrusting of the players. quality of your players. Mm. Yeah. And this isn't a guy, he didn't say this when he was at Porto. This, these experts are from at Real Madrid, the most expensively simple team of all time. He's essentially telling you guys, I don't trust you with the ball. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And that's my point. I like I would probably subscribe to that kind of philosophy if I had less, able, less players. able players. That's my thing. I will never ever go to e- even know, with a club like Chelsea. I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> He's work, he's work you know, Jose's with, made some pathetic excuses this season. This, this, that little horse thing is, is outrageous. He it's was outrageous. working with the likes of Luka Modric, Jabi Alonso, Di Maria. I don't listen to that. Ozil. I don't, that doesn't make sense to me personally. I just wanted to know what you guys thought of it. The, thing, the thing about Jose Mourinho for me yeah, is that I feel his character, basically, he's a winner, he's a leader. Like, and when I talk about him, I see him as a guy who could have done whatever he wanted in this world. He could have gone into business he could have opened a corner shop anything <laughs> and he would have been successful at it because he puts that much work in mm. I think he just chose to be a football manager and when you see the way he plays and the things he says it's just like where is your where is your joy in it like like there's a reason Barca are so heralded it's because the football they won but the football was attractive as well and but you see with Mourinho yeah yeah the, the image he gives outside doesn't seem to be the same image these players have of him I think his play, these players love him completely. Yeah, I, 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 think, him. I think a lot of what he says in the media is not what he really truly believes. Like, I, I think he played, he plays, he plays, he plays a game that was very clever. He's, I'm not going to lie, it's not very boring. But I, 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 I just think that he, he plays a game with us, and some of the things because he doesn't really. My, my thing is, like I said, that's all well and good when you're facing Barcelona, who will pop any team to death. That's fine. But listen, man, you're playing Sunderland at home. Are you serious? Mm. Are you serious right now? 
Like, I, I saw it coming. Like, he's never ever comfortable with, you know, playing expansive, beautiful, free throwing football. And he shouldn't, like, that's his philosophy. He shouldn't have to feel comfortable with it. I, I read somewhere that it was after the Sunderland League Cup defeat. I, th- I thought it was after they lost to Stoke. But I think it was a Sunderland game where you essentially said, listen, we're going to go back to basics. 1-0 wins are easy to do. That's what we're going to start doing. Yeah, because they that's were shipping on two, three goals a game. That's why. But that's yeah, that's fine. That's the absolutely guy, fine. You're going in pre-season, right? there was an article about um, Chelsea building a Ferrari and giving it to Mourinho who, for Pep, but ending up with Mourinho who builds tanks. And how yeah. the, the Chelsea squad is a confliction of his style. Mm. So, so, so I think I think what he, he tried to he tried to do it their way, and it doesn't work for him. And and when you try something that isn't your style, the second it goes wrong, you say, right, that's the problem. I'm going to go back to my way. And and, and that's what he's done. Yeah, and, the and of, the the testament that is the City, the Liverpool games, where his style has has been proven. It's worked. Yeah, 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 the thing, it, works. It, it works, but that's like, for me that. That kind of mentality, that kind of minimising our errors, maximising theirs, that's absolutely fine when you're the less, like you're the, you're the the underdog. But a lot of the time, he applies his logic when you're not the underdog. And do you know what people, especially Chelsea fans, are like, you know, watch when you get a striker, watch when you get a striker. A lot of these games it has nothing to do with your striker yeah. because it's the look at the way you set up. I wouldn't want to be a striker playing for Chelsea. Do they get the chances created for them? I know. On look, a regular look at basis in, to, look in to, Madrid. It was awful watching Torres just chase down oh look, my God. a fifty million pound striker, and he was just chasing balls down the channels. No what chance me, right? When people get defensive, they're like, "Okay, um, what do you expect to do? Play open football? We're not Arsenal." I'm like, "Listen, you know, you do know you can play cautious, conservative football, but still build attacks. They've got quality players in their to... ranks. They've got the likes of Oscar, Hazard, William. There's players, Schürrle to a degree. There's players there who are able to create chances for their strikers." Of course, did. Two, they, two games in a row. They did listen. They were playing the same in terms of the areas. They were just as deep as Chelsea play. Yeah, their def, the, the defensive midfielders, Modric and Alonso, were doing just as much defensive work. But lo and behold, they still managed to put together proper counter attacks. I'm not, I, can't, I didn't watch the um, second leg of the Atletico Madrid game in its entirety, but the first leg and the Liverpool game, you literally leaving your striker on there by himself. Fifty yard gaps between him and the midfield. Mm. Boy. I know. It, I, I mean, Torres gets a lot of stick, but Jesus. Rightly so as well, to be fair. Yeah, right. No, 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 no. He doesn't, doesn't, doesn't stand a chance. Famous. But it's just for me, it's a thing where I think people are starting to realise how special DJ Drogba was because no other striker, let me think about it, let me think for two seconds, no other striker since he's taken over after 2004, 2005 has been able to Replicate really flourish. flourish. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I for me, it's back. He, he suits that, that, that way of Jose playing to perfection. Yeah. I think it's a case of, yes, there's strikers that can get out there. Sorry, and you cut out. But why did he get rid of Lukaku then, if, if, if that's what he wanted? That, that oh, <laughs> Lukaku isn't the same animal. No, he's not, but, he, 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 but he's, he, he's got the potential to be. Like, Jose is getting away with making excuses for things that are of his own doing. Do you guys think Lukaku will have can can make the grade at Chelsea. I don't think he's good enough, personally. But um, currently, no, I don't. I think I think, I think Diego no, 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 Costa is a better shot for them. For me, it's not so much the it's at, it's, at, it's at Chelsea. Um, I just think it's it's the fact that it's Mourinho. I don't really see attacking players, young attacking players, really developing, like really developing young attacking players. You know, if it's a fullback. Like Surely, has, has, what about has, Hazard has, has come on leaps and bounds under Mourinho, has he not? Really? You think? But I think with Hazard... He's had a much better season this season than last season. I think with Hazard, it's more the mental and his approach to the game. The ability with Hazard's always been there. They've been yeah. touting this guy since he was 17. But I think Jose Mourinho's got him focused and on his job, and that's got the him, difference. He's got him playing, for me, he's got him playing no different to the way Arjen Robin was playing when he was playing well at Chelsea. He'll get. He'll be productive. He'll be playing very well. Don't get me wrong. But in terms of his technical and tactical ability, for me, there's no difference to what he, he's doing now to what he was doing at Lille. No difference. Yeah. And I think yesterday. Uh, I, mean, I, I didn't see him much at Lille to, to 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 have an opinion. I mean, we saw him yesterday. I mean, he was sort of like in charge of tracking 
wingers. I don't know. think he was fit yesterday, personally, but yeah. he was a fit. Yeah. I, I mean, it it just didn't look right, did it? It looked like when Arsenal had Ozil trying to play left back, sort of oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, to, be, to be honest, I hate that whole thing of these, these players tracking back and doing defensive. I I, I proper hate it. I proper that's, hate it. that's a reason. I've, apparently, I've, um, I heard why Ben Arthur hasn't really featured at um, Newcastle. A lot of the players don't like the fact he doesn't track back. The fact he, he doesn't, doesn't have, work hard. And I, I, think that's, I think he's a good enough player to affect the tick effect. The game, he should be playing yeah, every week. He should be playing yeah, every single week. He's their best player by a mile. Mm. That's my opinion. Okay, guys, any other questions before we wrap it up quickly? A guy asks me one, or I think he asks all of us one. It's about players celebrating versus their old clubs. Like, oh, yeah, I saw that. didn't celebrate last night. Apparently. Yeah, I saw that. Um, so, thoughts on, yeah, thoughts on. I think they made a big deal out of it in terms of it doesn't matter. If he doesn't want to celebrate, then he doesn't want to celebrate. I, don't, I think they commentators on the pundits yesterday made a big deal out of it for no reason. I, 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 I understand it when it's your club, as in your actual club, like Torres is a Madrid boy. Yeah, yeah. I, I get that. But when it's players like... I, I play in the Roman League, yeah, and we had a player that about a month ago, he scored and he didn't celebrate against the club he was at for three games. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and I caved him on Twitter because, like, there's, there's, it's just pathetic, isn't it? You're just looking for fake love. Like, when Van yeah. first celebrated against Arsenal and people are like, how can he celebrate? I'm like, why wouldn't he celebrate? No, I, I still don't. Th- I still don't think Van Persie should have celebrated. But I can understand. He should have celebrated. We've been caning him for eighteen months. No, I just. I I, you gave him dogs abuse. To be fair, I don't see why. Yeah, of course he should celebrate. That, yeah. that, I, I will be on this podcast for an hour discussing why pod and um, why Van Persie shouldn't be celebrating. Well, give us a brief indication. As I, to I'm why. not. I'm not even going to get into it. I'm not going to get into it. But <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I agree that it gets ridiculous because you have people like um, was it Hulahan who didn't celebrate the season. He, yeah, because he was going to join the team and it didn't go through, so he chose not to celebrate scoring against yeah. them. I mean, it just gets ridiculous now, doesn't it? I mean, hey, players hey. feel like they they owe. I, I, I just don't get it. I think. It, I think it's just. I think it's specifically the relationship with the fans. If the player's got a good relationship with the fans, or you come back to your old club and the fans aren't caning you or they're not chatting shit about you, then yeah, that makes sense for you to not celebrate. But if you're playing the fans and they're swearing at you all match dissing you cussing your mum cussing your wife of course you're going to celebrate like a madman that makes perfect sense I don't think he would have celebrated the way he did I think with Old Trafford if he didn't get the boost that he was getting well I I agree man that was anger there was anger in that of course can you not can you not understand why there was anger so what is he supposed to be the bigger man or something what what, right have we got to be angry at him sorry I don't don't get it I don't get what right I don't get what right what the fact that he was injured for how many years and oh. the first season he's fit he chooses to jump ship yeah but and he wanted to win it was the first season he was fully fit for a whole uh, season like, like, them, them fat guys that sit at the Emirates just, just insulting everyone like it's not, <laughs> it's not true like it's not, Van Persie did his service for us he never yeah. he never he did he did he was there for 8 years and eight and years. how many full seasons did he have Ant? Play, playing on the wing for Adi Bayor and Eduardo like he, he did his job yeah, and he, he did his, he did three, two seasons where uh, he was our main man. Yeah, and we made twenty four million out of him. No, nah. <laughs> it, it doesn't it doesn't sit right well with me anyway. Like, <laughs> well, well, I think he's a cunt. Not be challenging for four. Yeah, they they shouldn't. And he proved it. He, he won. The, obviously, we've not had the best of seasons this season. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> but um, last season he won the league. So mm. justified, the season, justified his move. Every player that's left Arsenal... Oh, of course it justifies his move. Of course it justifies... I'm not. I'm never going to sit here and tell you he wasn't justified leaving. I'm just saying, I just you think... You didn't want him to. You wanted him to show, I love Arsenal football club. I wanted him to show an ounce of loyalty. That's all I wanted to show. Wanted he him showed to show. plenty of loyalty. He never, he showed, he never showed loyalty. He never showed loyalty. He carried us He stayed years. at a club because he had nowhere else to go. You think, you think Man United tried to buy him about four years ago? Did they? Yeah. Oh, I don't know about Ver- that one. Fergie tried to buy him about four years ago, and Wenger weren't having it. Like, people have been on Van Persie from day. I've read Fergie's book. Fergie never mentioned anything about that. No, he didn't Let's say every transfer he ever went in for. No, but no, but he had an entire article, he had an entire chapter on Van Persie. There, there was loads of speculation about him going Man United about four years ago. 
What mm. I would say is fans have this feeling like players owe the club something, and you kind of have to. No, not, yeah, owe the club. Nothing. I'm not saying. I'm not even talking about the fans. Van Persie owed us nothing. He owed Wenger and the club something. That's all I'm Wenger saying. Wenger didn't keep him there for, for fun, you know. Wenger kept him there because he know, knows if he's Of course, player, but Wenger, Wenger player. was the one that took all the risks good. on him. Wenger was the one who took all the risks on him. But if, he wasn't, if he wasn't the player he was, if he was, I don't know, to give it a Giroud, um, but, the Giroud, the defender, he'd, he'd ship him out because he's not good enough. Yeah, I don't, yeah that doesn't matter, yeah. but that, that's besides the point. Venga no, still... His ability is why they want him. Everyone is a commodity to somebody else. His yeah, but Venga, Venga still showed him. the faith in him. Venga still showed the faith in him. He could have shipped him out ages ago when but he was he injured. It's the same as Diaby. It's the same as Diaby. If Diaby was to have a mammoth season next season and then join uh, Man City... No, that would be ridiculous. No, but, no, but it's the same principle to Van Persie because you've got a guy on like... That's completely different. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Van Persie played... How many games did Van Persie play for Arsenal in eight years? Van Persie is Arsenal... I think he's like... He's in our top ten goal scorers of all time. You know that, right? In eight years? He's in our top ten goal scorers of all time. He, he's how many not, games? Yeah, how but it doesn't take was, much to get into our... Fia Walcott's going to be in our top goal scorers soon. He's, he's, two, two, two seasons he was our main man. Come on. Two and a half seasons. Two and a half seasons. When he came back in the December and he scored 18 from the January to the end of the season, the next season he got 30 and then the next season he got 30 uh, again. Let me be honest. Let me be honest, man. Let me be honest in it. At the end of the day, if I'm Van Persie, I, will, I have obviously been looked after because I've not played an X amount of time because of the various injuries in it. But I'm 28, going on 29. So... I'm only going to be at my peak for a maximum of two to three years. All right? That's provided I don't get any more injuries. Now, I've continuously seeked reassurances that Arsenal are going to start purchasing, you know, start moving in the right direction. But I think that they did. The season that they signed him, they signed Kozula, Podolski, and and you could say Giroud. Giroud probably wouldn't have come. But I reckon if we had Van Persie last season, we would have been up there. What would you have done? No, no, but I'm just, no, let me, sorry, just to finish, right? For me, it's a thing where I think if if we had shown more, and for me, just signing Carzola and Podolski isn't enough because for me, it's not just the personnel. It's also seeing the different ways we handle injuries and tactics and stuff. You know, they see they see more than us, right? And so someone like Van Percy, like I said, he this guy, he's tactically adept. If he's not seeing enough, he can't just rely on sentiment because guess what? Yes, they might have, you know, been patient with me, but my career is finishing at the top level in the next three to five years. Arsenal football club has been going on for ages. They can, and they, they will. Have time to get rid of me, they will wait a second. No, to get but rid we're of talking me. about Arsene Wenger here. We're not talking about Arsenal football club as what? as an establishment. Yeah, Lewis, we're talking we about Wenger. Why Arsene Wenger kept him though? He did it for his own benefit. He didn't do it out of charity. If, if Lionel Messi had come available on the same day that Van Persie said he wanted to leave, and us Arsenal fans would said, "Oh, do you want to keep Van Persie or do you want Messi? Which one? What of, would you have said?" Of course, Messi, but we're, that is well, so then, unrealistic. There you go. So we ain't no better. So why do we deserve any? No, any, any, because, any different? because I'm talking about his the the low he he needed to show to Wenger. But it's not loyalty, but it's you not loyalty, no loyalty based on either. sentiment or trust. It's loyalty based on the fact that listen, he it's is not, one of the best strikers in the world, and Wenger knew that. That's exactly why he kept him, Lewis. Lewis seems to think. Because I tell you what, I tell you what. So so to cut you, that's listen. Cool. If that same guy was Francis Jeffers, he's <laughs> gone. Remember, remember who gave Van Persie the platform. No, we're not disputing Van Persie that. Talent gave him the platform. Van who? No, 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 no. Because. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. Because Van Persie was not the same sort of player that he that he was in 04 when we signed him. It's a of both. Wenger obviously gave an opportunity at Arsenal, but his ability based, was always based there. On, based on his ability. If he weren't a good player, Wenger wouldn't have looked at him. Like, Van Persie wasn't a joke. Of course, but you're underplaying the, the, the other factors that Wenger had in Van Persie's development. Now, for me, the thing is, at the end of the day, Van Persie... He always had talent, but it was the mental aspect and the injuries in it. So there was a chance that Wenger took with him anyway. No one is disputing that. But ultimately, it came down. It comes down to his ability. Ultimately, no one's ignoring the other variables. Yeah, but wow. then you're, so basically, that no players should should show any manager loyalty because they're only there because they're a commodity. They're a player. Is that no, what you're saying? Because, no, it's just the fact that you have to look at also the other variables, such as his age. Such yeah. As, okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. Is. How, and how likely are Arsenal supposed to compete at the top, top level? Because it's not just the league. Obviously, I understand why well. he left. Obviously, I understand why he left. But I'm saying that he could have showed, he could have showed 
and in my opinion, he should have showed maybe a little so, bit more loyalty. So you're saying he should have stayed for another year? I think he should have stayed another year. Finished wolf again. Well, we don't know, do we? Because we don't know. That. That, we, we don't know. We don't know because last season, the only thing we lacked, in my opinion, was goals. We lacked. We look. We lacked goals last season. What? We did. Oh my God, we lacked the goals. Only thing? It was one of our. It was one of our poorest attacking sides I've ever seen. I agree. With under Wenger, we, we, we scored more last season than we, we, we did this season before we went back. Exactly. Sorry. We scored more, we scored more last, last season. Right. season. Yeah, because Van Persie was scoring them. Van Persie got about 40 goals last season, the season before, when he left. But we scored more but, after he left. We scored more the last season than we did the season he was there. We scored more when? We, we scored, scored more, more last season without him. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm saying. It was, no, what? Uh, well, so we didn't like goals. All right, I'm, I'm confused, but what I'm saying is, is <laughs> would, you lot, would you lot not agree that last season was one of the poorest attacking sides we've ever seen under Wenger? Regardless of the amount of goals we scored, guys, I'm on I'm on one percent, and my charge is not not cooperating with me right now. <laughs> <laughs> my charge is not cooperating, and it? it's giving up on me. Isn't it? All right, well, uh, we're gonna leave it there anyway. I think, um, yeah, an hour's gone, so we should we should probably wrap it up. Um, thank thanks for joining us today, guys. Um, thank you to all the panelists and stuff. Um, Catch us on iTunes and YouTube. Uh, look on our website for some new articles. An, an, an article got published this week. Um, so, so, so check that out. And also get in touch with me if you want to post any articles as well. But yeah, thank you guys. I'll see you next week. Can I say one last thing? Go on. Kiri Gibbs needs to be England's number one left back. in England. Ah. Let's say amen. Let's say amen. Okay. All right. Later on, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right.